delighted to be here speaking to you today. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to come on a Monday morning right after Daylight Savings Change, so um, I'm really grateful that you're here. Um, I'm a, do, I, I obviously teach in the medical school, as, as he alluded to, but I'm also an infectious disease clinician in the medical center, adult infectious diseases. And um, it, uh, sort of unofficial uh, acknowledgments to my division chief, Ingrid Bloomquist, who helped me a whole lot with this talk and kind of pushed me into this area, a very interesting area. It sounds a little boring at first, but it's actually very interesting and a lot of uh, new information coming out in the last uh, couple of years. So no financial disclosures. A few medicines I'm going to talk about off-label use. Uh, here are my session objectives today. So by the end of my talk, you should be able to describe or discuss clinical scenarios in which asymptomatic bacteria should and should not be treated with antimicrobials. The evidence behind withholding screening for and treating bacteria, bacteriuria in the confused elderly patient. And finally, discuss oral antimicrobial options available for treatment of multi-drug resistant urinary tract infections, which would obviate the need for admission to the hospital and IV antibiotics, which is so common. So an outline of my talk, which I'll kind of bring back here and there, and so you're not wondering how much longer the talk's gonna go on. First, we'll do some poll questions and I'll state my goals. Then we'll look at a clinical case and a story from the literature. We'll look at literature guidance on asymptomatic bacteria urea. Then we'll finally look at options for treating multi-drug resistant UTIs and then go to conclusion, conclusions and our repeat poll questions. So if you have a computer or a cell phone or some sort of a tablet, you can participate in this Poll Everywhere poll. Um, you simply go to this pollev.com with my name or if you have your cell phone, text this to this number to join, and then you can select which answer you choose. So this first question is, if an elderly patient is admitted to the hospital with new onset confusion, think about what you would do. Would you order a urinalysis, a urine culture, if this patient came to your hospital? I'll give a few minutes see if people can log in. Hopefully it's actually working. Should be, looks active. Okay, there we go. Anybody gonna vote who hasn't yet? Otherwise, I can move on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the first one takes a little while. Once you're logged in, then the rest of the question should not be as hard. Will we get ten? Uh oh. Waiting for the 10th person, maybe. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Oh, 11. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So let's see what people say. Okay, definitely yes is by far. Um, nobody says definitely not. Most people say definitely yes. They would order your NASS and your culture. Okay, let's go to the next one. Same scenario, if, if this patient has a urinalysis, now you've got your results, came back. Shows pyuria, white blood cells. Shows bacteria urea, bacteria in, in, the, in the UA, urinalysis. 
You don't have your urine culture back yet, though. It's pending. What would you do? Would you start antibiotics right away? Empiric antibiotic therapy? The 11th person is still deciding. All right, while you're deciding, I'm going to show what people's responses are. Oops. Okay, still probably or definitely yes takes most of the, oh, some maybe 50-50. Maybe you'd wait. Okay, continued. If the urinalysis shows pyure bacteria and the urine culture is now back, greater than 100,000 colony forming units per mil of E. coli, you would start antibiotics right away. Again, it's empiric because you don't have the susceptibilities back. So what do you think? Would you do it? And most people are saying definitely yes, at least more than half. Some probably yes. There's a few holdouts who are saying maybe or probably not. I like the dissenters there, it's great. Okay, and finally, last question. If the E. coli comes back as an ESBL organism, an ex extended spectrum beta lactamase, in the E. coli. I would start IV meropenem and consider putting in a PICC line. ESBL is the, you know, the multi-drug resistant. Usually only carbapenems are the only antibiotic that you can use in this case. So would you, would you do that? Would you not? And our response is, oops, probably not. Okay. All right, we're going to come back to this. Some of my goals today for all of you, even the ones that said maybe, maybe not, right? I want to convince you by the end of this talk that you don't need to order a UA or, or a urine culture in every confused elderly patient that presents this way. Okay? You don't need to treat with antibiotics every confused elderly patient that has white blood cells in the urine, bacteria in the urine. You don't need to admit to the hospital every patient with a multi-drug resistant urinary tract infection in order to give them IV antibiotics, okay? And usually when I give this talk, there's some skeptical frowns in the audience, and we'll see if I can at least shift the poll questions over. So let's look at a clinical case. This is a 79-year-old uh, female nursing home resident. She has diabetes. She has frequent UTIs. I should have put that in quotes because that's a loaded statement. We're not always sure what that means, frequent uh, urinary tract infections. So she developed some acute confusion at the skilled nursing facility, and she's sent to the ER. This is her physical exam. She's confused, oriented to name only. She's pretty dry, uh, oral mucous membranes are dry. She's tachycardic, her lungs are clear, her abdomen is soft and non-tender. She has no rash on her skin. Uh, the ED does order, the physician does order a urinalysis with a reflex to culture if the urinalysis is, is um, abnormal. Although it's labeled as a clean catch, um, we kind of all know that that isn't always true of what's labeled. So it's actually, oop, something happened. It's actually co collected with a bedpan and then poured into the specimen container. This is not the way it should be done, but in actual practice, this does happen more often than we'd like to admit. Okay, and the urinalysis comes back. There's no nitrites, um, which may, may not indicate 
uh, bacteria in the urine. Uh, some bacteria don't uh, develop nitrates. There are 30 white blood cells. Normal is anything above, anything above five is abnormal. There are some red blood cells, so a little bit of pyuria. So the physician decides to start her on an antibiotic, ceftriaxone, and admit her to the medicine service. And one day later, there is a positive culture. And lo and behold, it's greater than 100,000 of extended spectrum beta-lactamase E. coli. And it is sensitive to meropenem, but resistant to all other antibiotics. So does this mean picline and meropenem for seven days or more? Sometimes physician would say yes, that's, that's kind of where this is headed. Okay, and you know, the, the problem's only gonna get worse, and it is getting worse. So here at Loma Linda, we do have a lot of ESBL organisms. We don't have too many carbapenem resistant organisms yet, but they are in the community. Um, so, but I think we are gonna develop more carbapenem resistant organisms if we just reflex to this sort of treatment without thinking too hard about it. The rates of Clostridioides difficile infections is gonna go up, and it, and it has, and it continues to go up, and the associated complications with that. Okay, pick line associated complications. Whenever you put in a pick line, you're at risk for getting a pick line associated bacteremia, uh, a risk for blood clots, and worse, an even longer wait time to talk to your infectious disease physician about getting meropenem approval. And you know, I'm, I'm a pretty nice guy, but when it comes to meropenem approval, I, um, I turn pretty mean and nasty, and I make the physicians tell me why. I spent way too long doing that picture, by the way. It was a good time waster. It was fun, though. So it turns out bacteria in the bladder are not uncommon. So the prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria is pretty high. These are just some numbers from a study actually done in 2007. Um, women in the community, so young, uh, young girls, 1% to 2% have bacteria in their bladder that doesn't need treatment. Um, in the, in the older population, it goes up 6 to 16%. In women, 65 to 90. If it's greater than 90, 22 to 43%. In men, it's a little bit less, um, but the numbers are starting to approach in the elderly, okay, up to 21% of asymptomatic bacteria. When we're talking about uh, patients who are institutionalized, who, are, who reside in skilled nursing facilities and other places, it can be up to 50% have bacteria in their bladder with no urine tract infection. And men, again, are a little bit less, but still pretty high. What do you think about those who have an indwelling catheter? Oops, I don't know why it keeps doing this. 100%, exactly. So I'd like to shift now to an interesting story I, I saw in the literature uh, a couple years back. This is a, I'm going to introduce you to a bacteria called E. coli strain 83972. That's an actual photograph of it. No, not really. Um, just an artist rendition. So it's actually a benign commensal, and it's been well studied and characterized for years. Um, it was originally isolated, I believe, in the 70s from a schoolgirl with stable asymptomatic bacteria for several years. And the strain, they realized, had lost all its virulence factors and had gained the ability to persist in the bladder the uropathogenic E. coli characteristics uh, that it had prior were inactivated. It optimized the ability to grow quickly, form biofilms, which means it's kind of forming efficient colonies and cities that are really hard to get rid of, bacteria cities. Um, and if you compare it with one of your typical prototypical uropathogenic E. coli, you can see the differences. So, the, the UPEC organisms can cross into the blood and cause bacteremia. They damage epithelium. They, when they're in the bladder, they, they latch on and they go up the uh, uh, ureters to the kidneys. They invade, invade bladder cells. They uh, produce a host response, which then causes a lot of the symptoms. The E. coli uh, 83972 doesn't do any of this. It's lost the ability to ascend the ureters, so it stays in the bladder. Um, it grows really fast and it forms a biofilm, but the host response isn't triggered, so it doesn't cause an infection and doesn't cause any symptoms. And actually, some interesting studies show that it will out-compete some of the bad strains as well and just kill them off and take over. Well, it's kind of interesting. 
It's actually being used in Europe, I believe this is in Denmark, as, as urinary tract infection prophylaxis. So in 2001, there was a pilot trial. These are patients with uh, chronic um, neurogenic bladder, spinal cord injury patients. And when they did an uncontrolled trial and they gave some, patient, some of these patients this, they infused the bacteria into the bladder, it showed a 33-fold reduction compared to the non-colonized patients in their ability to get urinary tract infections. When they did uh, a trial that actually was double-blind, controlled, um, <laughs> uh, randomized, it was a two-fold reduction, so not as much, but it still showed some improvement compared to those who were not colonized with the bacteria. And there's ongoing, that's Sweden, not Denmark, so ongoing studies in Sweden in a lab where they use an inoculation protocol where they uh, will, they'll actually treat the patient with some back, uh, antibiotics to get rid of all the bacteria, then they'll infuse this bacteria into the bladder and then see how they do. So this may not come to the U.S. anytime soon. It, it may, but it, it may not. But I guess the point is I'm bringing this up partly because this concept of treating some bacteria actually might potentially cause harm rather than help. If you think about it, killing off the non-pathogenic strains will make room for more pathogenic strains. Now this is not just theoretical, there is some literature out there to support and it's probably gonna grow as more studies are done. This specific study was done in young women who had recurrent UTIs in an STD clinic setting, okay? And they took some of them, they treated their bacteria, uh, bacteria urea when they were technically not symptomatic and then they left others alone that had bacteria in the urine without symptoms. And those that got treated for the bacteria in the urine, again, without symptoms, they ended up getting urinary tract infections more often than the patients that they just left alone and left the, the bacteria in the bladder. Again, these are both patients without, without symptoms with bacteria in the bladder. So, very interesting findings. Well, how do we decide then? This is, this is a conundrum that comes up for any clinician you know, when, they, when they're presented with a patient, they find out there's something that leads to bacteria in the bladder. Um, this is a really tough decision. I, I can't say it's easy, an easy decision to decide who you're gonna treat and who you're not gonna treat. You know, what does asymptomatic really mean? For instance, um, some patients just can't give a history. Um, and I'm talking about even patients who are able to talk to you and carry on a conversation, but they just can't guide them toward telling you what exactly is going on. It's very difficult. Um, the, the population I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes more is, is those who are elderly who have new onset delirium or something happened with their mental status change. Um, there's some who have chronic urinary symptoms. You know, you ask them, do you have burning with urination? Yes, I do. Oh, you know, it could be an infection. I've had it for five years. It's been the same for the last five years. Well, that's different. That's not an acute urinary tract infection necessarily, often not. And then a patient that I've had, um, and at least one that I've followed, is somebody who gets frequent urosepsis, and they don't have any urinary symptoms prior to their urosepsis. It's just all of a sudden, boom, and they're down, and um, they're very sick in septic shock. So um, it's a difficult issue, I, I agree, but I think there's some principles that we can understand and apply to help with this, this issue, and there's guidance in the literature. So let's look at the literature uh, guidance. So first of all, there are, there are criteria that have developed. Now this is specifically talking about long-term care residents, you know, so that setting. But there's specific criteria about when you should test and when you should treat, called the LOBE criteria. Um, and there's, I'm not going to go through all these criteria, but it involves you know, fever, dysuria, urgency, flank pain. Um, there, you know, when, when should you order? Should you have one symptom, two symptoms, et cetera? And this is really meant to be a minimum criteria for ordering tests and treating. But I just will, the main reason I'm showing this here is that you don't want to, um, you don't want to order or treat based on these criteria because there's actually no mention about confusion. So the, the thought that every patient that comes in confused, they could have a urinary tract infection causing that confusion. That's just not um, borne out in the literature or in this, this guideline here. The Infectious Disease Society of America, and this is actually what prompted me to, to develop this talk in the last year. Um, in, 20, in March 2019, so about a year ago, 
these guidelines came out, and I had a preview of them even before that about when to uh, treat and when to not treat asymptomatic bacteria. So, and these guidelines have been in place for years, but this is an update. So, um, there are times when we will screen and we will treat asymptomatic bacteria. So one case is in pregnant women. Now there may be a small subset of pregnant women who do not need to be screened and treated. That's coming out in the literature soon. But overall, in most clinicians, and, and it's hard to tell which one you should and should not, so everyone tests and treats pregnant women, even if they have no symptoms, they, they want to catch bacteria in the air. And the reason for this is even asymptomatic bacteria can lead to pyelonephritis or preterm labor. And some of the numbers I've seen is up to 20%. So you don't want to miss that you know, to, um, in, a, in pregnancy. The other case is before an invasive endourologic procedure. Okay, so any a urologic procedure that's going to cause significant mucosal bleeding, um, you want to test and see if there's bacteria there and then kill it off before the procedure. And that's because if you don't treat it, it can lead to periprocedural bacteremia, bloodstream infection. And I think we've all seen patients like that before where that can happen. Okay. There's a whole list, though, about whom you should not screen, and it's been updated in this new 2019 guideline, so get ready. Infants, children, healthy, non-pregnant women. Don't screen them for bacteria in the urine. Don't treat. Elderly men and women in the community and long-term care. Don't do it. Diabetic patients. Spinal cord injury patients. So some of these, you may be surprised, right? Oops. Non-urologic elective surgery preparation. Renal transplant patients greater than a month out. This may be debated by the renal transplant physicians, but the renal transplant guidelines came out around the same time, and all they did is they pushed it out a month. They said after two months, you shouldn't be screening and treating renal transplant patients for asymptomatic or bacteria. So I, I say one to two months, e either way. I'm, I'm not going to argue about that. Solid organ renal, non-renal transplant patients. Low risk neutropenic patients. So if your uh, ANC is above 100 and you're only going to be neutropenic for a week or less, you don't need to screen them for bacteria in the urine. Okay. Now there's also a category that you don't really have enough evidence to say should you or should you not screen for bacteria in the urine and treat. So as high-risk neutropenic patients, we just don't know. We don't know if it's going to help them or not to screen and treat their bacteria in the urine. Renal uh, transplant patients in the first month after transplant, or maybe the first two months if, if you're going with the renal transplant guidelines. And those who have short-term indwelling catheters at the time of catheter removal. Okay, so it may be helpful, we just don't know. All right. Okay. Now, what about delirious patients? That was my promise, that that's what I would talk about, right? Should I send a urine culture on a patient with delirium? Is delirium a symptom that makes bacteria, bacteria in the urine into a urinary tract infection automatically? Not necessarily. Should I treat bacteria in a delirious patient because they can't tell me about symptoms, right? If the, if the criteria are symptoms of a urinary tract infection and that's when you treat, what if they can't tell you? So should you just treat everybody? Not necessarily, often not. And attitudes are changing about this. You know, there's, there's been more understanding of how, how antibiotics can harm a patient, not only side effects, potential side effects, but causing C. difficile infections, um, causing multi-drug resistance in the community, not only in the patient, but in the community. So these are the risks that we face, okay? Um, and then there is a growing literature with delirious patients in bacteria urea that suggests treatment of this is not helpful and could be harmful. And I'm just going to go through a, a few of these briefly. So this is a 2011 study, adverse outcomes in nursing home residents with increased episodes of observed bacteria. It's a prospective study, and there was really no association between mental status change and bacteria in the urine. And treatment of the bacteria in the urine led to multi-drug resistance. Okay. Here's a 2015 study, again, a prospective cohort study, nursing home residents. Treatment of suspected UTIs with antibiotics didn't change mortality um, in those who had advanced dementia. Here's a 2017 study, um, prospective study, again, in delirious older inpatients. 
and when their bacteriuria was treated, it was associated with worse functional recovery and more C. difficile infections. This study also reviewed 33 prior studies and looked at association between UTI and altered mental status. Many had really no clear association. A few of them did, but again, the definitions of UTI were a little unclear. They included fever, which then I would agree, if you have fever and you have bacteria in the urine, then you have to be suspicious for a urine tract infection. And a lot of them had potential confounders. Okay, so what are we supposed to do about this in actuality? I, I would say that the evidence is not extremely strong for saying you shouldn't treat yet. There just hasn't been really wonderful studies done out there. But what I can say is we know what happens when we use a lot of antibiotics, side effects, C. difficile infections, multi drug resistance in the community. If we don't know if we're helping the patient by treating them when they're altered mental status and they have bacteria in urine, we should balance those two out. If we don't know we're we're doing any good, yet we know we could be potentially harming, then we really need to carefully think, should I really be using this antibiotic in this case? So here are the suggestions from the IDSA in this 2019 document for an elderly patient that comes in to the hospital with delirium. Very simple things. Take a deep breath, check their vitals. <laughs> you know, physicians should take a deep breath, right? Um, Hydrate the patient, you know, if they're, if they're dry. Maybe that's why they're tachycardic, they're dehydrated. Remove any offending agents, other contributing factors. Look for other causes of delirium, okay? And then if in the end you decide, you know what, this, this patient looks like they're gonna go into sepsis, I'm really concerned about infection. If that really is true, fine, but don't stop at the urine then. Don't investigate and say, oh, bacteria in the urine, boom, got it, UTI, we're done, treat. Because if that's going to be true in half of the patients, depending on how old they are, or all of the patients, if they have an indwelling catheter, then you may be, may be missing some other source of infection, and you're, you're coming to premature closure on the case. So do a, a workup for sepsis from other sources as well. Okay, and then this is what I, if, if you haven't gotten anything yet, and the first two minutes kind of puts you to sleep, now's the time to wake up, because here's the, the crux of the issue, this slide right here. I like to think about risk versus benefit for each case. And this is actually my approach to all of infectious disease consults. In commencing antibiotics, am I willing to put my patient at risk for C. diff? Because that's what happens with most antibiotics. Some are worse than others, right? Am I willing to risk other toxic side effects of antibiotics? And granted, most of the time, these don't manifest themselves but you never really know when you'll get side effects, some pretty severe side effects from antibiotics. Am I willing to increase the development of multi-drug resistant organisms, both in my patient as well as in the general community? Because these are all the things that antibiotics will do. And the answer might be yes. Hey, if they've got an infection and they need treatment, then these are all risks that are worth taking, absolutely, to save someone's life, to, to uh, decrease morbidity. But we can't afford anymore to use the phrase, I'm gonna treat just in case. Um, I like to use the analogy of the oncologist who doesn't treat a, a patient who might have cancer just in case they do. Um, they, you know, they wanna have tissue, they wanna have a diagnosis, they gotta go through their protocols, they're not gonna say, yeah, there's a mass there. Well, just in case it's cancer, let's start some five floor year cell. That never would happen. And that's a little extreme, I know, that's, it's, it's an analogy, but I, I do like to think of antibiotics as chemotherapy light because some of them do have nasty side effects and some of them can have, even those of more benign can have nasty side effects in certain people that we don't know about. So that's the way I like to approach it and how I like to teach residents and students and even um, uh, my colleagues. Okay, a short bit on options for treating multi-drug resistance UTIs, so taking it in another direction. Any questions along the way, though, before, is that's, that ends that little chapter on my talk, if there's any questions. Yeah, you'll, and you'll have time at the end, too, if you, if you want to ask questions. Okay. All right, so what about you really do have a urinary tract, and your patient really does have a urinary tract infection, and it really is caused by a multi-drug resistant organism such as Pseudomonas, 
that's multidrug resistant, vancomycin resistant, enterococcus, extended spectrum beta lactamase, gram negative, uh, carbapenem resistant, enterobacteria ACA. Does this always mean that you have to admit your patient to the hospital for IV antibiotic therapy and give them a PICC line? No. So here are some oral antimicrobial options that might be employed in these cases that are not always thought about. And I'm just going to go through each one. So nitroferentoin is one of the most commonly recommended or used antibiotics for cystitis. Um, really, that's the, its only use because it only gets into the bladder. It doesn't get in penetrate tissues, kidney. You can't use it for pyelonephritis. Um, it is one of the first line therapies for simple cystitis in the guidelines. And there are some stipulations, though. If the patient has poor kidney function, less than 50 mils of minocratin clearance, then it's not going to get into high enough concentrations in the bladder to kill off the bacteria. So it, it not well known, it's actually potentially is effective against some ESBL organisms, some carbapenem-resistant organisms, E. coli, Klebsiella, even that, uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. Um, you'd want to have the susceptibility data on the, the organism that you're going to use it for, but if it says susceptible, you should trust it, and if they have cystitis with one of these multidrug-resistant organisms and their kidney function's good enough, there's no reason why you can't use this as the therapy and avoid IV meropenem or IV daptomycin. So that's nitroferentoin. Trimethoprim sulfa, okay, can be used for all levels of urine tract infection. Cystitis in the bladder, prostatitis, pyelonephritis, when it ascends into the kidneys. And the package insert will tell you that you can't use at a certain level of renal function. Um, we do uh, sometimes. It really can be used for any level of renal function. It just it, it affects what side effects you might have. So if somebody has, is in end-stage renal disease, you may have accentuated side effects. But sometimes that's an acceptable risk-benefit balance, and we decide to use it. So really, uh, there's no reason you can't use it as long as you're willing to um, balance the risks and benefits at any level of renal function. And it's potentially active, again, against ESBL or CRE organisms. But I would use it only if you have the susceptibility data and showing that it is a sensitive uh, treatment for, your organ for the organism your patient has. Ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, the fluoroquinolones, again, can be used for cystitis, prostatitis, pyelonephritis, any level of urine tract infection. And these, all, these two, the cipro levo and the trimethoprim sulfa, they all have very good oral bioavailability. So doing them IV is not necessarily going to get you a higher concentration of drug than doing it orally, as long as your patient is absorbing the drugs. It can be used, again, in any level of renal function, as long as you renally adjust the dose. The problem here is there's been a lot of FDA warnings against the fluoroquinolones. Um, we knew about tendon rupture as one possibility, very rare, but still devastating side effect. Well, there's new ones coming out about um, AAA rupture in those who are at risk. Um, there's even sort of a, a stroke mimicking type symptoms that Cipro might cause, and I've actually even seen that once myself. Um, there, so, so these are being recommended against unless you don't have alternative therapies. So I say this with some caution to if, if you have other options, I wouldn't use these automatically. But again, they're potentially active if it says susceptible in your little report, susceptibilities, they are potentially active against ESBL, CRE organisms, and pseudomonas that's multidrug resistant. Okay, so potentially very helpful. Who's used phosphomycin before? Okay, a few of you. This is actually also in the guidelines recommended for simple cystitis. We don't often think of phosphomycin. It's, it's not available in the U.S. as far as I'm aware yet, IV, but it is available oral, and it can be used for cystitis and prostatitis. Maybe not pyelonephritis in its oral form. Um, can be used for with any level of renal function. Potentially active against ESBL-CRE, VRE. 
The caveat, at least here at Loma Linda, I don't know about other places, but we don't do susceptibility testing, and I'm told we will not be doing susceptibility testing anytime soon, unfortunately. So when we use this drug, we're taking an extra level of risk, um, and we're balancing the risks of, well, I don't want to put a PICC line and give them meropenem. That's just too dangerous in this patient. So let's finish off their therapy with uh, you know, phosphomycin. This will last two to three days, too. So you can give an oral dose and then um, give another dose three days later. It lasts longer than the normal antibiotic. And then finally, methenamine. Who's used methenamine before? Yeah, okay. So this is not really an antibiotic. It's an antiseptic. And it turns into formaldehyde in the presence of acid in the bladder. So it's really used to sterilize the bladder after UTI treatment. So after you're done treating the patient for your urine tract infection, you can give them this, and really they can just stay on it um, for long periods of time. Again, this, the stipulation, though, is if, uh, if they have poor renal function, it's not going to actually concentrate in the bladder well enough. Uh, it is potentially active against anything, uh, but it requires acidic urine and retention in the bladder. So if somebody has a Foley catheter and you actually have to clamp the Foley for a few hours to make sure it builds up in the bladder before it will be effective. And a lot of times it needs co-administration with vitamin C in order to get the urine acid enough. You have to test the urine to see if it's acid enough. So another caveat is that if you're using it concurrently with trimethoprim sulfa, it can cause the trimethoprim sulfa to precipitate, and that would be a problem. Okay, so on to conclusions then and our repeat poll questions. So my conclusions, the guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America in 2019, just a year ago, still recommend testing and treating asymptomatic bacteria in pregnant women and before invasive urologic procedures. Um, Number two, confusion in the elderly is not considered it by itself a symptom that should trigger testing or treating for uh, the bacteria. If you have a patient, an elderly patient who's bacteriuric and they have delirium and they do have signs of sepsis and urinary concern, then don't stop at the urine. Test and treat for both urinary and non-urinary sources of that sepsis. And then finally, remember there are oral antimicrobial agents that could be used in treatment of your multidrug resistant urinary tract infection in your patient that will not require you to admit them to the hospital and give them a PICC line. Okay, same questions as before. Let's see if I've changed anybody's mind. So here's the elderly patient admitted to the hospital with new onset confusion. Would you order a urinalysis and urine culture? I think I increased the probably nots. Okay. Still some definitely yeses, but I think it shifted a little bit. If the UA shows pyrene bacteria, would you start empiric antibiotics right away? Probably not. A lot of probably nots. I like it. I'm not keeping track of you, right? So you, you can you can really you can vote what you believe. I'm not keeping track. Sorry. Okay, if the UA is dirty and you got E. coli at a greater than 100,000, would you start antibiotics right away? Probably not. I like it. All right. And then what about if it's ESBL? Pick line, meropenem? All right. A lot of probably nots and definitely nots. Thank you for your attention today. I'll entertain questions.
questions. I'm sure certain there will be some questions. Thank you for that uh, thoughtful presentation. I'm not sure if I'm quite there yet, but uh, yeah. I'll be thinking That's about fine. it. Um, so, you know, going back to your case, if, if, if the patient had a negative CT scan, if the x-ray was clear, if there was no rash, no signs of sepsis, but she was delirious, but she, there was clear bacteria, um, do you think that a clinician would be faulted for starting antibiotics? Maybe the, maybe, maybe the converse is true, like, because you, they're there. You have to do something. Right, so that, I would say that's been kind of a prevailing thought process, especially I think in the ER, they feel the crunch um, that, hey, this is my only explanation for this confusion. If I don't treat, I'm actually gonna get dinged and in trouble, especially, you know, what is that chance that the patient then goes on three days later and becomes septic? Um, the attitudes are changing, I think with this era of antibiotic resistance that's moving toward almost a pre-antibiotic era, I think the attitudes toward that issue are changing. And um, this is definitely the IDSA's push to get people to really think twice about, about doing it. I don't think we have enough data yet, though, in that patient population. I read another, like an opinion piece on, we don't have enough studies yet in that specific population, right, that um, new onset acute confusion with all these factors, with no obvious sepsis. We need like a whole study of people that just fit that category <laughs> and then do the study on that to really be, I think, sure. So I think right now, um, really what the IDSA is saying is take a deep breath, and really think through before just reflexing to treat them automatically, which I think in the past has been done. And that's the approach I take. But I, I, the last thing I want is to force clinicians to say the other way and just say, whatever, you know, confusion doesn't mean UTI, and I'm not gonna treat, and then everybody starts dying of sepsis. That's the last thing I want. And, um, and I think it, everyone knows, and, and every, every, all the we clinicians, we understand that sepsis is gonna cause acute confusion, right? I mean. That's part of it, and so it's it's tricky. But but I think the attitudes are changing. the 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 thought process just needs to be there, and the pause, and weighing the risks and benefits. I think needs to be there until we get better data. Yes, in a person with recurring UTI symptoms, shown to be sensitive to nitrofurantin by susceptibility testing, each time they develop a recurrence of their symptoms. Do you feel obligated to get a repeat culture and susceptibility test? Good question. I think I am biased with that because of my patient referral, my patient population referral being an infectious disease physician. I don't think I've ever, at least not lately, made any decisions without the culture and the susceptibility. I, usually it always comes to me. Um, but, uh, but I can speak to the guidelines for treatment of UTIs don't always recommend getting cultures every time, especially if it's just cystitis. Um, so I think guideline-wise, you're not required to get cultures, especially if it's you know the um, healthy young women population, you certainly don't need to every time. So but if there's problems and there's complications, you, know, you do. So, yeah. Any other questions? Question over to your right. When you look at the nitrofurantoin MIC compared to MIC of other antibiotics, do, are you obligated to go with the most sensitive, one that would be most effective, or do you still go with the nitrofurantoin because it's uh, so sensitive? So thank you for that very good question. This is, this is actually a point of confusion for a lot of us, a lot of physicians, and labs report things differently sometimes. But I would say that most labs, 
will report the MICs with numbers, okay? And unfortunately, those numbers lead us to think that they mean something and can be, and can be compared successfully. Each number for MICs is only relevant to that antibiotic. And that's because different antibiotics have different molecular weights and different concentrations at which they'll kill organisms. So a less than or equal to one for one antibiotic versus a less than or equal to 16 for another antibiotic, there's no relationship and it can't be compared. It only means something to that antibiotic. If it's less than or equal to, then they're both underneath the sensitivity. And you have to make your decision not between the different numbers that you see, but you have to make the decision based on the appropriateness of how a lot of pharmacologic characteristics of the antibiotic and where the infection is. Does it get into the urine? Does it penetrate? Do they have a good renal function or not? Um, and the side effects it may cause in that patient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much for that question. It's very important. Question down here. I realize I'm asking something that crosses specialty lines and may be terribly threatening, but for postmenopausal women, uh, their vaginal flora changes dramatically to more pathogens. Yeah. Um, anybody ever write or recommend simply estrogenizing topically the vaginal mucosa to try and prevent urinary infections? So certainly, um, and that, that's actually one of the classic um, cases where in the outpatient setting that you really need to distinguish is this patient having issues because of vaginal dryness or is it actually urinary tract symptoms? I didn't touch on that at all, but um, if, if somebody is working up a urinary tract infection they, and that is true of your patient, those characteristics, that should also be in the differential and worked on as well, for sure. Thank you. I am. I deal with this kind of thing all the time as an emergency physician and uh, I can understand the uh, reluctance to treat on the basis of a quote clean catch end quote urine uh, but I, I wonder if if we were to do a cath and you got somebody with no other obvious cause of uh, of uh, Acute deterioration in mental status, mm -hmm. and um, we did a we did a cath specimen, mm -hmm. and we got 30 WBCs and uh, 10 uh, let's say 10 RBCs because it's cath, and um, and negative nitrites. Uh, would you feel comfortable saying don't treat that? So, my answer would be yes. Um, and that, and yes, we would always ask for, if we had our choice, we'd always ask for a cath specimen. But I think what, what the IDSA would be saying is, even if you got the best specimen, there doesn't seem to be a correlation with bacteriuria, even pyuria, and always urine tract infection. Again, we are lacking the studies in that specific patient population um, to really give a definitive answer, but um, because of the risks we know and we're not sure of the benefits in somebody who lacks overt sepsis, we would say to hold off and to look for other sources. Now the follow-up question is, um, three days later the patient comes in and has uh, reptorian UTI and in fact has pyelonephritis mm -hmm. and has a complicated course and they call me into the uh, emergency medicine committee and say, right. why didn't you treat? Do you have literature to back me up? So I, I don't think we have definitive literature yet, and it needs to be a discussion and a process that looks deeper into this issue. Um, that's the very issue that I'm worried about. I, I'm slated to give this talk to emergency physicians here at some point, and I know that that's, I know it's easier for the medicine, the family medicine, the other physicians to kind of accept this and because they're not gonna be on the line the same way that the ED is gonna be. And so I, I feel that that, we really need better evidence driving forward if we're gonna give you enough evidence to get you out of that sticky situation, yes. 
a lot of us will see patients, maybe they have some urinary frequency and urgency, a urinalysis gets done whether or not it, you know, Right. And the, um, they have this so-called asymptomatic bacteria. The patient tells you, I had this before I wound up in the hospital with sepsis. Right. I want you to put me on antibiotics. What would your response be? So I would say that that's a difficult issue. You voice understanding. Um, but I've had patients who specifically have had, like this one patient I have who has had nine urosepsis episodes over the last 15 years. Um, and her physicians and now at this point were putting her on antibiotics. They were testing her urine every month and putting her on antibiotics every time. And she was getting toxic from the antibiotics. And she was pleading with me, is there a way out of this? And we stopped everything and said, don't test, don't treat. And um, so far, it's been a couple years, and she's been fine. So I, you, know, you can go either way with your stories. Um, and I think, I think there needs to be thoughtful consideration of both sides. And I'm not going to argue with a physician or necessarily with a patient every time like that. But I think there just needs to be thoughtful consideration of the, the detrimental side effects of antibiotics. And then there needs to be more studies moving forward. So, yeah. Well, one, one more question. Curious to get your thoughts on um, virtual medicine. Um, it's, a, it's a growing field. Mm -hmm. uh, one company, Teladoc, has 26 million members, mm -hmm. 2,000 independent practitioners. Uh, I'd say that antibiotics probably is prescribed 70, 80% of the time empirically. Um, I'm thinking as an IDSA person, you have to be concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, you, know, the, the, the t you know, the virtual medicine doctors, they have their literature too backing them up. You know, they say that, um, um, uh, you know, that, that they're able to get their docs in line so that they can decrease empiric use of antibiotics. Um, and I know that, you know, as I, I've been doing telemedicine for about six months, and I'm still kind of sorting out my feelings about it. But um, you know, they we do get reports where we, you know, they they try, they have these guidelines where they want you to, pres you know, prescribe antibiotics less than let's say 30% of the time for um, for uh, diagnoses such as you know they have a, a broad diagnosis for for URI such as sinusitis, um, you know, URIs things like that, and you know they're they have these target measures where they try to get you to like less than 30% of the time. Um, and you know, we do have issues with access to doctors and virtual medicine has been looked at as a key tool to help with uh, those patients who have very, have, have difficult with access, whether it's in urban areas where doctors are just, they have too many patients to see, or even in rural areas where they're just, there's not a clinic in miles. So I'm curious to get you what, what your perspective on that is. I do a lot of curbsiding. Um, I, I do it, though, kind of in a worried, with, with, a, with concern, because I know that a lot of times the information you get from the physician you're kind of consulting with or trying to help, um, and I'm assuming right now that uh, this is telehealth from physician to physician. I guess there's also telehealth just from physician talking with a patient, too. Um, so I haven't done a whole lot of that. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to always get the right information. So you're, if you're talking to another physician, there's all this stuff in the chart that ID physicians are really good at finding needles and haystacks about patients and, and making decisions. So I, you're missing all that, and it's really tough to make a good decision sometimes. With, um, with telehealth, where you're talking to a patient and at least getting good history, you're missing your physical exam, which you know, that's still important. Um, although if you can see them, if you can do video conferencing, that's, so I think that's, that's probably preferable if you're actually viewing and talking to a patient and, and, and maybe even seeing them with a video camera. I think that's a really important. Um, but if it's just physician to physician, you're missing a ton of possible, ton of information. So, well, one more question then. One more question and then we'll have to move on. Uh, maybe I missed it, but, uh, is there a way to figure out these domesticated E. coli? Is there a way to figure out if this is a 
is a benign E. coli or? Good question, really good question. Nothing commercially available right now. It's, I'm, I'm sure sophisticated labs could do a lot of tests and figure it out, but there's nothing commercially available that will tell you, does this have UPEC characteristics or is it ASB characteristics? I, and I know that's, I, that would be great if we, could, if we could do that and go that direction, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rog said. Let's give him a, hand, a round of applause. Thank you very much.